Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Exporters Eastern Cape panel discussion. We're really looking forward to engaging with you this afternoon. And um, yeah, this is our second panel discussion that we're having online in these turbulent and interesting times. So welcome aboard. And we do know that people will be popping on. We've got 37, 38, 39 coming in. And I know that there were over just over 80 registered. So it'll be great to um, have you on board. Thank you, Ron, for already using the chat box. That's great. Um, feel free for everybody to please um, add in any comments that you have or questions that you have along the way. We may not engage with you in that moment, but we will come back to those questions as much as possible. Um, so like your business, Export of Eastern Cape ourselves, we've had to relook at the way we do events, the way we bring things to life as well, and had to think on our feet and adapt to make sure that we are still engaging with our own customers and bringing you the value that we so promise. So welcome aboard and thank you for joining in. And thanks to all those that are going hi, 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 and good to see you all on board. We welcome all our members and guests. And um, as I mentioned, we're delighted to have over 70 people registered. And I know that people are coming in. We are now up to 45 online. So welcome aboard. My name is Jane Stevenson. I'm the Vice Chair of Exporters Eastern Cape, and I'll be the host for this panel discussion. So today's conversation is really going to be looking at COVID period. Um, and I know that we've often spoken about, well, what are the challenges and everything? And initially, there was almost this, well, it's only for a couple of weeks. Um, lockdown is for so far. You know, uh, maybe it's another month or so. And I think what we settled into is to realize that we are now a couple of hundred days into this and it's not going away very fast. In fact, if anything, we've learned some good lessons along the way and it's here to stay for a while. So a lot of the conversation today is going to be around adapting, not around COVID particularly, but around the new landscape of how business looks and adapting. So we're going to be looking at challenges, successes, some tips um, and some real down to earth goodness good conversation with the four panelists. So we'll host the panelists for around 45 minutes, engaging in different conversation, and then we will open for Q&A. But as I mentioned, feel free to post your questions at any time directly into the chat box, and we will keep track of those as we go. Um, if you are disconnected at any point, just by the way, because as luck would have it, your line may go down, our line may go down, who knows what happens on, online, right? But if that happens, just refresh um, in your tab bar and you should come straight back in without a problem. If we freeze, panelists do the same thing, so don't worry about that at all. So who are our panelists and why have they been chosen? We have decided to try and look at a cross section of different industries who export on a regular basis. And in doing so, to really make sure that we we try and see what's going on. A lot of times when one industry is hit, another really does well. I mean, take outside of exports. You know, the entertainment industry, for example, and tourism has been hit phenomenally and will take a long time to recover from what has happened. And yet the retail and essential services have absolutely blossomed. So we've tried to take a good look at a cross-section of panelists. So from the automotive industry, we welcome Tony Pinar, Departmental Executive for Supply Chain Management and Quality at Isuzu South Africa. Welcome, Tony. Thank from you, the service man. industry, we welcome Jason Meyer, Production Manager of Packaging and Planning at San Miguel. Welcome aboard, Jason. Um, from logistics industry, we welcome Lauren Goddard, um, SA Regional Country Sales Manager of Expeditors International. Welcome again, Lauren. Hello. And from ports, we welcome Captain Faisal Sultan, Senior Manager of TMPA Port Operations. Welcome, Faisal. So Thank just you. before before we go into the panelists, I do want to say that I know there's going to be a lot of conversation around the ports and in particular the bigger picture. And Captain Faisal is here on behalf of TNPA Port Operations, so that is the Port of Port Elizabeth, not on behalf of the whole of Transnet. So let's not shoot him down too quickly and too early, please. He's a he's a tough guy. I know him well, and um, let's be kind and fair along the way as well. So, panelists, thank you again for your time and your expertise, and I know that our, our viewers are going to have great insights from what you bring on board. So many of the industries have felt the wrath of this virus, of this pandemic. And let us not forget 
that this is not our company, it's not our city, it's not even our country, it's the entire world that has been impacted in some way. And we have watched globally, locally and nationally, businesses plummet, they close their doors, they have had to um, literally be turned upside down. But on the other side, we have also seen industries pivot. We have seen the most incredible industries not only survive, but absolutely thrive in this time as well. And some of you are, in fact, in those industries. Innovation has come to the fore without a doubt. And the complacency of us humans who like to do the same thing in the same way and will get to change somewhere down the line has definitely been challenged. The carpet has been pulled right out from under us and we've been forced to think differently, which is not a bad thing. In fact, I saw today, um, a, it was an advert by one of the ad agencies that put out, let us not ever wish to go back to abnormal. And the word of abnormal coming at the end, whereas we always talk about the old being normal, their push on this advertising campaign was at, actually the old was quite abnormal. We just didn't realize it. So on that note, I'd like to bring the panelists in and to please just as a starting point, can you share with us how has this pandemic actually affected your industry? Tony, can we start off with you? Right. Thank you, Jane. I think as we start off before we get into how it impacted our industry is to pick up on what you said where this is of a global nature. So if you look back at 2019, you already saw global GDP slowing down by 0.7 of a percent versus the year before. You know, you bring that a little closer to home and you look at our domestic, our local economy, we only had 0.2 percent growth in 2019. So I think coming into this, you already had the makings of fragile economies and a slowing global GDP. So along comes COVID and you put that on top of it. And we look at the industry that we're in from an automotive perspective, and we see year to date, till the end of September, the total domestic vehicle production is down 36%. Total vehicle exports down 37%, and our own total domestic sales down 33%. Now, in an industry like the automotive, the supply chains are long. Um, a lot of us are importers as well as exporters of components and vehicles. So that means you immediately have an impact on that total pipeline of supply. And that impacts all stakeholders in the industry, whether that be component suppliers, service providers, or even people who are supplying uh, uh, consumables into the business. I think that's forced everybody to have a look at what they're doing. We've had to drastically make cuts. We had weeks and weeks of inventory sitting on the water inbound. We had to find solutions to that. And then we've got to restart an industry and to start those supply chains back up again. I think as we, we look back on what we've seen in the first nine months of the year, we're now starting to see some normality coming back. We're starting to see some markets who are recovering to a certain extent as they're getting out of various levels of lockdown and we're seeing some activity starting to return. So generally people will talk about the industry being down 30%. The numbers I've quoted are slightly higher than that. So that points to some recovery through the back end of the year to get from where we're seeing here between 33 to 37% to even out of the 30. So I think it's it's been a massive impact on everybody across the industry, of which I'm sure there will be a number of uh, suppliers or service providers on, on the line today who are having the same experience. Thank you. Thank you. Jason, do you want to... Yes. So from St. Miguel's perspective, and I can probably speak on behalf of the rest of the citrus um, producers as well, um, we were in a very fortunate position to, to being able to still strive in, during this um, anomaly of a year, where we as an industry have many production trees, of many trees that still needs to come into production. So this was a very high, especially in the Eastern Cape, the crop sizes was very high. And we managed to break uh, export record volumes. Um, just to mention also a few points with regards to downsides um, for us, operating cost increased um, slightly due to the added cost incurred in the value chain um, to confirm to government regulations and also the impact that these regulations had on the production efficiencies. And on the upside, um, the demand increased when everyone went crazy to get um, additional vitamin Cs. And then also, um, which was quite strange, was absenteeism for 
us in the industry reduced quite drastically, especially during the um, the phase where alcohol was banned, and also with the implementation and improving of hygiene practices um, in our industry to, to be able to still continue um, to run production. Awesome. Thank you so much. And you mentioned the alcohol ban. Um, just before you jump in there, Lauren, and I see Dion's already online asking if we are armed with a glass of wine, and Uday is saying, oh, we didn't. So um, I'm being absolutely damn boring with my water bottle, none, nonetheless. But I guess we are considered working while they are considered playing. So thanks, Dion, for, for reminding us that we are at work here. Lauren, <laughs> Can you share some insights from your industry? Thanks. Yes, thanks, Jane. Um, for the logistics industry, the impact was obviously very huge. I mean, borders were shut, airlines were grounded. Uh, there was a sudden and very huge drop in volumes across the globe. Uh, you know, McKinsey Global Institute um, estimates that the global unconstrained trained trade demand could drop as much as 13 to 22 percent in the third and fourth quarters of 2020. Now, to put that into contrast, the largest quarterly decline in trade volumes was during the global financial crisis of 2008, and that was around 5 percent. And we're there anticipating 13 to 22 percent, right? Wow. Um, so we, we've, we've seen a major impact to companies, especially those that might have been financially at risk already and um, before COVID. Uh, some of our top freight forwarders we've seen uh, have implemented significant job cuts um, and 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 uh, higher freezes due to the drop of obviously in volumes that they were carrying. Uh, short time was implemented. We've had you know lots of our colleagues and ex-colleagues we've heard stories about um, in their families, how, how they've been put on unpaid leave, three months unpaid leave. So there's been a lot of um, struggle in, in that area. However, we have seen things like increases in healthcare uh, companies with their volumes, especially air freight sites for personal protective equipment. Uh, what we're seeing right now in that sector is a real a strong and great collaboration around the vaccines and how logistically we're going to get all the vaccines out yeah. to, to the globe um, and looking at the other elements, not just the vaccine itself, but the valves that are needed, the packaging that's needed, the manufacturing that's going to have to go into all of those additional um, you know, products to support the distribution of these vaccines. Um, and then one of the key things I think in our industry that we saw was that mass transition to working from home. You know, yeah. uh, those that invested obviously in cloud-based uh, global operating systems made the transition easily, while others obviously struggled. Uh, the need uh, for for the up-to-the-minute information, and I can honestly tell you, uh, having you know gone through it myself with many many of our customers, there was such a hunger for information. And, and real-time visibility with regards to um, key milestone events in the supply chain uh, during that period. Um, and so that became really crucial, and, and I foresee that that will, will continue. Great. Thank you. Interesting that you you, you mentioned as well the personal side of, and I think that <laughs> it's something that we might need to touch on just now, is the, the emotional um, impact of COVID. And whilst productivity can carry on online, there's definitely been an effect into the culture within companies where people are not necessarily connected on technology, but they're not connecting as humans. Absolutely. Any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, we've seen it, um, uh, you know, within on our side, on the productivity side, um, that uh, just having that teamwork and team spirit, which is a strong part of our culture. Um, as the leaders of the organization, we've had to really look at more creative ways of staying connected, right? And and it's been a challenge. I mean, I think we're, we're, we're putting things out there to the people for ideas on how to do this. Um, we, we've had some uh, global, I mean, not global, some um, team lunches and that sort of things via Zoom when we were in a full-on lockdown and even now. but. 
I think that's going to remain a challenge, but we have seen um, the impact. We've had, you know, quite a few staff members that have struggled with this, uh, you know, disconnectedness in this more connected world, if you want to put it that way. Yeah. So, well, um, absolutely. I mean, we had to, as as exporters Eastern Cape, I mean, we had our gala dinner online. I mean, who would have ever thought we would do something like that? But the, but the thing is, we cannot... We cannot wait for things to change because this is the way we live at the moment. So you've got to live in the moment, right? Um, yeah. Tell me from, from an Isuzu perspective, Tony, how has, just on that part, on the emotional aspect of our team, how has that affected or have you seen anything happening? Because they say that the emotions are running high and in fact, uh, factually, the teenagers are the ones that are really showing signs of major depression at the moment. So, so Jane, I think the experiences that, that we've seen within a, a fairly large group of our staff is pretty much the same as what we've just shared here now. So we've also tried to do things differently. Certain meetings, you have to have your camera on. And that's just to get people to see a familiar face again. You know, something as simple as that makes a difference. Yeah. Um, we have pockets of people who have returned to the office. So pretty much the operational people are back in plant. And that does drive a disconnect. We, yeah. we hear from the teams at home that although from the outside it looks, it appears to be more efficient or as efficient as being in the office, but it's taking people longer to, to get to the same result. Because instead of having a discussion with three or four people, you've got to send five or six emails, try and get hold of people. They're online in calls, difficult to get hold of them. So, you know, we, we've also gone through and done our first virtual launch. So. You know, a new product or a vehicle is a very tangible thing. People like to see, touch, and feel it. And, and to have done that uh, virtually was also a new experience. And it some was. people do that. Absolutely. And, it really well. and I know the media were very impressed with how you handled that as a brand as well. Um, Faisal, Jason, anything on that point just before we, we move? Anything that you want to add into that? And we'll move to the next question. No, I think from our side, I think it's we've been exposed now to this virtual reality and it's now just basically to go back to basic and to find a happy medium um, once this lockdown um, has passed us is to see how we can interact and join the virtual reality back into business as we know it. Because I still yeah. think that there's great opportunity um, by, by adding the virtual reality to your business model and there's also some costs that can be saved with regards to reducing of traveling costs. Great. Captain, from your side, anything you want to add? Yeah, to that yeah, thanks, Jane. So from our perspective, you know, we identify this issue of emotional problems of the employees in the very early stages of this COVID-19. And, you know, Transnet being a very large organization, we have a service provider actually um, called IKS Metropolitan Health, which is in place, and we extended this um, you know, assistance not to the employees only, but the entire family of employees. Wow. So from that perspective, I think we have done quite well. Thanks. That's amazing. Well done. And um, I think it's going to be something that's going to talk its toll from here on. You know, I was saying to a client the other day, it's almost like you can't phone anybody anymore. You've got to book a Zoom call or a Teams call. We forgot to have to even pick up the phone and say, hi, can I, you know, it's almost like, hi, can we book a call? And and I think we've got to navigate to find a balance in all of that, quite rightly. So, Tony, you mentioned that um, your your um, industry was 30% down. And yet I want to go to, to Jason because you've had a very, very different experience in the citrus industry. And in fact, you've had a record-breaking season this year despite the coronavirus. Um, so perhaps you could just share the juxtapose of those stats. Yes, so um, again, I'm speaking on behalf of um, San Miguel and not the entire citrus industry. Um, but just to give you an oversight over the export volumes of 2019, uh, we did about 127 million cartons, uh, where this year we are, the latest estimate is very close to 150 million cartons of all citrus types. So for citrus, it's really been a booming year. The crops was there and there was a high demand for the fruit. Um, but with regards to our experience as San Miguel, I think initially with regards when the lockdown started, it was a very big scare. Uh, when they announced the lockdown, as there was a lot of uncertainty on how the markets would react and how the local protocols would be implemented. However, we were blessed 
with being able to operate under the restrictions and being part of the essential services and markets being very strong in accepting um, the citrus products with an increased amount of vitamin C, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, we've experienced many disruptions to the full value chain, um, but all in all, I think there were a lot more positives than negatives. Also, most of the bigger game players, Jane, um, in the citrus industry got connected relatively quickly um, when yeah. um, the lockdown was announced uh, with the aim to support each other and to ensure the success of the citrus production and exports. Great. I've never actually considered um, vitamin C being an essential service, as in like oranges and lemons. So thank you for highlighting yeah. something which, I mean, I just think of it as fruit, right? Um, oopsie, yeah. sorry, my camera. My camera's off. My apologies there. Um, so it's quite interesting that when you say we were essential services, like, wow, how does that work? But of course you are. Um, yeah. So, yeah, just shows you how we think in boxes in terms of the way we know. And there it is, right? So moving over to the automotive sector, um, Tony, from your side, I see you've shown solid sales figures and, and you have mentioned some of the challenging aspects, etc. But can you... Just share a little bit more into the experience of the past few months and what it looks like. So, so Jane, I think to, to divert a little bit on that is, is to share maybe some of the story. And it's, and it's more around the culture and the behaviors that, that go to driving some of what we feel drive the results. So right. as you wind back the clock and you get to early in the year, we already had a team kick into action in early February. So being an automotive we have some 7,000 part numbers coming at us from all around the globe at any given point in time. And we had this team who then started to already delve into the <laughs> supply chain and identify right down to second and third tier suppliers where the risks were. And at that stage, everything was focused on what was coming out of Wuhan or in certain parts of China. And as that started to grow, this team worked deeper and deeper to keep the, the supply chains going. And we're in effect able to do that until we got to our hard lockdown. So, so I think that was the first step in that we were able to keep as normal a flow as what we knew at that point in time of components that we could turn into product. Right. Obviously, we then get to the hard lockdown in, in, in March. Um, and just before that, we set up a daily COVID command team where we had the key decision makers in the room, uh, initially in a room, second, then we all moved to be offline as we got into the hard lockdown, where we would assess the events that had taken place the previous day, what had changed, because everything was changing on us faster than what we could keep pace with. And we would change decisions that would impact us on the coming days and weeks. Two days later, you do a 180 and a complete turnaround on that as more information became available. And that became the order of the day to have a plan B, C, D, E, and F, and you might not even use any of them. Yeah. All right. Um, our next priority then became our staff because we work with a fairly high number of people in a, in a fairly small space. So that we spend a lot of time up setting up and looking after their well-being. And that, that also flowed through into our eventual return to work where we put in place a number of activities through our medical facilities where every employee who worked on our sites, including third-party service providers um, and contractors, went through a medical screening process and were then issued with all the necessary PPE, and we started to move back into the facilities in a slow, controlled manner. Initially yeah. only getting up to 50% volumes, and later as the uh, risk levels decreased, we were able to get back to full production. So again, through that period, we now get into where we have an oversupply. So you go from being short of something to having too many of them as you readjust the total pipelines, um, and we had to make those tough decisions. We've spoken about it earlier, decisions yeah. that impact yeah. people, um, and those were made. Um, you know, we also, as a company, fairly early on, got registered as an essential service provider, and that was really there to support our slogan of saying, you know, with you for the long run as Isuzu, but we had a number of our clients and customers who were using our products to fulfill an essential service. So we had to keep dealers open, we had to service vehicles, they had to be repaired, or they had to be maintained. So to do that, we had to find ways to open our industry. We had to bring along a number of service providers with us to get them also registered as essential service providers on the back of what we were doing, and continue to push as hard as we could and find new ways of doing things, getting our dealer networks back, in, back into play. So through a number of those initiatives, ideas, 
proposals that we'd worked through in the first 21 days of lockdown, which, by the way, were probably the hardest any of us had ever worked. There was no such thing as yeah. sitting at home. You were working seven days a week, sometimes 12 to 16 hours a day. Um, as we tried to get every one of our team members on board with what we were going to be doing so they knew when they got back to work what they would be expected to do. Um, we spent a lot of time focusing on the items that were within our control and not trying to get caught up in the emotions of what everybody else was doing or trying to second guess what was happening out there. We were trying to deal with the facts that we had at hand. Again, I think that is another aspect that plays into it. So what I'm trying to share here is a little bit of the culture that we try to instill. We were trying to be different, do things differently and hit the ground running. And a combination of all of those, I think allowed us as we came back to post some results that were much stronger than what we expected and at a higher share than what we'd expected to get into the market. And that was by providing the industries who were critical with the tools they needed. Yeah. And some thanks for sharing that. And there's some interesting points you say there where you say the first 21 days of lockdown were the hardest we ever worked. And I, I'm with you on that one. I think that many of us who run businesses did not close our eyes um, very much. And yet I look on Facebook and the whole world was baking banana bread and, and having a holiday. So I don't know what we were doing wrong, but they were all having fun. Um, but I think one of the things that you mentioned as well is the need to adapt and change. And just when you think you know what plan A and plan B looks like, they are thrown out the window. And there's been a lot of criticism in the world to the leaders of the world, as well as to the WHO, et cetera, for not actually standing by a decision. But I think the reality of this, much like with those larger, you know, from a macro perspective, many of us in business are doing the same thing. We are working with intelligence that comes through in the moment and adapting to that in that moment. So I don't think anyone in the world has answers and a perfect plan of how this rolls out. Even, even now that we know what we're going into, we don't know, you know, as I mentioned to you both, uh, to you earlier on a call, I was with a client in the Netherlands earlier, and they've gone into hard lockdown again. So just when they think they're getting out of it, they go back into it. So I think we were on a bit of a roller coaster ride for a while. And that brings me to the logistics, which is obviously a vital component of exports, right? So Lauren, if you could maybe just share with us, what has the impact been and how have you overcome the challenge from um, a logistics perspective? Uh, so from our perspective, what we saw, uh, especially on the export side, was um, frequent changes to export sailing schedules. Uh, we see we saw a limited capacity on vessels due to rollovers from previous sailings. I'm sure many of the exporters have experienced this already. Shipping shipping lines that were just cutting and running as a result of delays on on the berthing. Um, you know, there were continuous delays at the South African ports, and obviously we do understand that COVID hit the ports quite significantly, especially when it came to a workers reporting for duty. Um, and and that drop in, 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 in um, staffing at the ports, obviously the Cape Town port, for example, had to close, right? And it dropped so significantly. Um, Carriers are, are being more selective, and I think the we, we all saw on the news what happened in Beirut with the with the explosion of the hazardous cargo. Um, so because they had are also having limited um, staff at the ports and the shipping lines, we've also seen hazardous cargo um, real restrictions being imposed on carrying the, the hazardous cargo and even just in the terminal there was like a 24-hour turnaround where you'd maybe normally have a, a three-day turnaround um to get cargo out of the port for hazardous cargo it was you know it was shortened um so what we've really seen also is that communication has been key with all the key stakeholders um yeah. really strong relationships with the with, with the sh shipping lines and transporters this this hunger for knowledge and information real-time visibility really was key especially as i as i mentioned before on supply chain milestones um and and we you know as a company we we decided to um you know initiate discussions with our service providers because we're a non-asset based company so uh, our service providers are an integral part of the service that we render to our customers 
Right. And um, we we reached out to them to understand, you know, if we could support them by even paying them earlier. So if we had 30 day terms with them, for instance, we pay them on seven days to keep them functioning as an organization as well. So right. lots of uh, volatility in the market um, and in the yeah. industry as a whole. Thanks, Lauren. Captain. Captain, my captain. <laughs> so obviously on the on the top of everybody's agenda in the export industry is the whole thing about the delays and the ports and how the impact. Um, there's been a question that's come through, and obviously we'll go to Q&A later, but I do want to raise the question now because Lauren alluded to it as well, is that there seems, you know, the port seems to have not re quite recovered from COVID at this stage, and there's still some constraints that are costing industries a lot of money. Now, I know it's costing the port a lot of money as well, so it's not like you're doing this for self-gain. Um, so can you just share with us a little bit of insight into what's going on at the port and the challenges that you have faced so that we can also understand that part? So thanks, uh, Jane, for the question. So just to put things into perspective, Jane, we just need to understand uh, South Africa is an export-driven economy, and and Transnet National Ports Authority in South Africa has got a complementary port system. We have eight ports. So in other words, complementary means the cargo can be moved from one port to another if one port runs out of capacity for that matter. Obviously, right. subject to the approval of the shipping lines and other players. Um, the biggest challenges that we have faced, obviously, in the port, our job as a land or port authority is to facilitate trade. <laughs> and that we have been trying to do our utmost best to do that. But obviously um, the challenges due to COVID-19 were, in my opinion, there were two major challenges. The first one was the, um, the well-being of our staff in the port. Obviously yeah. our soldiers on the ground, you know, to making sure that uh, we are providing 24 seven service to our customers to make sure that their, their demands are met. And secondly, the safety of the crew of the incoming vessels into the port. That was the biggest challenge. So from that perspective, I think Port of PE was the first port in the entire port system that came up with this idea of implementing, you know, COVID-19 related health declarations together with special SOPs were put in place to make sure that we do business in a very responsible and controlled manner. So yeah. by doing business that way, we managed to basically, you know, ensure that uh, the spread of COVID-19 was not as much as it was in the other ports. Uh, if you look at the stats around the country, uh, from the port of P perspective, we had about 21 cases up till now positive, and all of them have returned back to work. There is nobody else currently in quarantine or in isolation. So that's very good news. And I think the other thing we need to understand that port environment is a very complex environment. You know, it's all about deviation management. So we spoke earlier about the you know the windy city. So if the port is wind bound for 24 hours, you can have a knock on effect of serious nature on the entire supply chain. You know, you so mean, we you mean that you don't we need, sorry, Captain, do you mean that you don't actually control the weather? Because I think sometimes we could. I wish I could, but unfortunately that's not the case. And and you know, um, so the, the knock-on effect on the supply chain is immense. And, you know, so everybody in the supply chain needs to their part properly. So, for example, I can give you, um, for those people who understand the logistics, they will tell you that if a shipping line gives you an inaccurate ETA of a vessel, you know, and they suddenly decide to cut and run from one port, you can understand the impact of that in the port. They are leaving the cargo behind, which is already sitting in the stack of the port. And on top of that, you want to bring in more cargo and that causes congestion in the port, as simple as that. You know, so the rescheduling and rerouting of vessels from other ports to, to NMB ports created a huge problem, but we're not complaining because there's extra revenue for the port of PE, uh, for that matter. But, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I think the other thing about this uh, port environment and management supply chain, you know, what really worked well for us I, in my personal view, was the, um, you know, we created a WhatsApp group this year, I think for the first time, especially yeah. uh, for citrus industry, you know. And the communication plan, I think, was key to this success story that we are all hearing about, reading about in these airports, you know. 
And I think going forward, this is going to be the key in terms of managing. I heard Sen uh, talking about increase over 30% of citrus uh, export next year. Yeah. So we need to be proactive in terms of making sure that the issues that we had this year are, 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 you know, are addressed properly. We have a pre-season meeting with the relevant players to make sure that all those complaints and all those uh, you know, teething problem, problems that we had this year are addressed to and resolved. Uh, yeah. Thank you for that. And I think that um, a key perspective you bring up there is communication. And we have seen it from the businesses we run, and we all think we're communicating really well, and then we're only communicating to one tier. We've seen it from the president of our own country, who initially was brilliant at communication and then kind of went a little bit incognito. And we only heard from him when big things were happening or major, you know, and I think there's a lot of leadership lessons to be learned along the way. And I know that um, with the ports as well and with all companies, they had to rethink a communication strategy. And an interesting thing today is if you wanted one channel to communicate to your target market, which channel would you use? Because if you have the answer to that, please let us all know, because there are so many multiple channels to try and reach people that it almost becomes... Um, a minefield and you say well you know what in the in the past we used to put an ad in the paper and everyone would read the paper and everybody would know or we put an ad on tv and everyone would know it but i mean there was only one channel in those days and now there's like 400 or 900 or whatever if you if you even have tv channel anymore so i think communication has been a really key thing tony you've mentioned it lauren you've mentioned it jason you've mentioned it uh, Faisal, you've just mentioned it again has been a real key learning from that so moving on to the next question that I have for you is what have been the two, if you could share with us two major successes that you have felt despite or because of COVID within your business? And Tony, maybe you could kick off for us. So, you know, we, from a successes perspective, there's probably two items that we claim as, as we've also gone through this period, had two record months um, with volume, the record volume since 2014. And, and then also recently, we've just seen that we've also picked up into the number two spot in terms of vehicle exports out of South Africa into Africa year to date. Now, I mean, those are the, the hard num numbers and the things that we all tend to live and die by. But if you look at the, the real successes within the business, I think what we've been through, we're predominantly a manufacturing organization um, here in Port Elizabeth in the Isuzu plant. But it was a means that I think going back Eight months ago, if you'd asked me, could we operate the business remotely as we have with a number of people at home? Um, the answer would probably have been no, but today it's become the way that we now do business, where anybody who's not carrying a part or building a vehicle is not sitting in the office. They're operating from home. We found ways to make that work, and we found ways to keep those people engaged. And that's probably one of the, the, the biggest wins that we've come out of this, how we've been able to take the culture we have in the company, keep it intact, find different ways of doing things, as I'd said earlier, and then move the bar forward in terms of what we were able to achieve. Thanks for that. Just on that one, before, um, just before you jump in, can I ask you, um, I had a query with a client in um, the UK the other day where I asked him, when this is over, whatever over looks like, um, now that we've found an efficient way to work remotely and almost the whole performance appraisal system has changed to make sure it's outcomes based, not productivity based. And um, I said to him, would you then allow people to continue to work from home? And his immediate answer was no. So if I had to ask you that question, what would your answer be? Do you see this as a way forward that it can work? It is working. And in fact, operating costs come down significantly and or do you see this as a time period? I think it's going to, for us, it'll be a mixture of both. Um, the, the nature of what we do, engineers need to touch parts. Um, you know, operations need to happen. But in, in the support, we'll pull some of the support functions. I think that will definitely be a way that we, we move forward where there may be not a permanent work from home, but there may be rotations, two, three days in the office and people move out. Um, yeah. I think, as we've said, COVID has not left us yet. And we still have to keep the social distancing in some of the offices. We cannot have everybody sitting back in rows and 100%. rows of desks in offices. 100%. And as Mitchell has just said on the chat, I think that for any business to have succeeded coming through COVID and still going through COVID is, in fact, a success in itself. 
Jason, yeah. would you like to share with us um, your major successes within the citrus industry? Yes, 100%. So, so firstly, I think it's um, the to orchestrate um, from the abnormal to the new normal, the way it's being managed, not only by our company itself, but as an industry. Um, and then also, secondly, to, to manage the high volumes that was export, um, not being as much involved. Also, like Tony have mentioned, so the actual production people were still there, but all the supporting functions, they had to operate from, from home or from, um, from the offices, and they couldn't go to the actual production facilities. So being able to manage record volumes and still achieving great success definitely shows that the, the abnormal is not necessarily the way we need to do things. And there are room for change and to improve. And I think this was a great test for that. Yeah, I think it has been a great a test of innovation and creativity yes. for humanity. And um, we can step up or we can step aside. And I think that the industries that we have represented here have really stepped up. Lauren? Yeah, so, um, you know, I think that for, for us and, and just all of us on the call, uh, many companies will say that their people are their greatest assets, right? But I think the truth of that, it only comes to the fore when we're in a crisis or when the company is in a crisis and how they, they manage that crisis with their people. So I would say, you know, I gave this lots of thought. We've had revenue growth in, in certain key sectors and all of those successes. But for me, I think as an organization, um, a global organization, we have 17 and a half thousand staff. I think our success really came in how we protected our people. Um, our, our global leaders um, were USA based in Seattle. They sent out a directive, um, you know, in the second week of March that every single office globally, and we have 187, um, would transition to working from home within three days. And we did that successfully with no major business interruptions. Um, so that for me was, and they actually made the directive even for countries that didn't even have one COVID case yet, right? Everybody was transitioned to moving, um, to working from home. Uh, I think also what we saw through that was that um, our approach as an organization to having a, a really um, detailed and uniform business continuity plan across all these different countries and regularly reviewing that business continuity plan with scenario planning, it really showed its worth during this crisis, right? Yeah. Um, you know, some of the other major successes as far as also protecting our people, we 100% commitment to our policy since inception 1979 of no retrenchments, no layoffs, and full pay during a crisis. And that actually paid off for our customers because the stress of, am I gonna have a job? Is my pay gonna be cut was eliminated from all of expedited staff? Yep. That, that was great. Right. Um, the way we reached out to our service providers to see if we could support them, how we could support them you know, um, financially, I think ultimately it resulted in us being able to take care of our customers with 100% focus on their supply chain crises at the time. Um, so that stability that we had as an organization, right? And through that, I think we've seen significant growth in air freight revenues, like I said, one example, and a steady flow to my surprise as the country sales manager of new business customers that really came as a result of referrals um, during the crisis and pro -cust proactive customer engagement. I really thought when we transitioned to moving from home, I thought that sales, you know, that thought went through my head, head was like, we're customer facing, we're, you know, we're out there meeting people. So what's going to happen now? But, yeah. um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that when it comes to challenges. I actually agree with you on that one. And I'll give you an example from my own business. I'm a business coach and strategist. And I've actually picked up new clients, but they have been in New Zealand, the UK, and, and the Netherlands. And um, so what I've realized is, um, and in fact, they found me, which is even more interesting. But what I've realized is that geography really is, is placed for holidays in the future. Because yeah, there, are no, there are no boundaries for, for how we work. And we cannot go back to thinking geography and location is other than the port, of course. Um, mm -hmm. But that binds you to a specific area because we've proven 
uh, through mm. this that, that actually you can do it from anywhere. Um, so, Captain, would you like to share the successes, the greatest successes that you guys have had? Yeah, thanks, Jane. I think very similar to uh, what Lauren alluded to. Um, I think the biggest success story for the Port of P came out in form of appreciation by our employees. And, you know, the manner in which we put these measures and controls in place to make sure they're wellness. And so I think that was the biggest success uh, coming out of this crisis. The second one, uh, in my view, is the, um, you know, the positioning of the Port of Port Elizabeth is, compl is complementarity to Port of Nuha when it came to export of um, uh, containerized fruit. Um, my understanding is that actually we broke a record this year through the Port of Port Elizabeth as well. And the third success story, um, Jane, is the export of fruit in pelletized form. I think um, nobody spoke about it, but there's another critical factor um, that we mustn't forget about is that we do export quite a bit of break bulk of fruit from the port of PE. And I think uh, going forward is going to be uh, quite critical to have this facility running, running and going because of the increase in the uh, citrus export next year means that we have to really cater for that form of export as well. And yeah, so that was the third success coming out of this COVID-19. And understanding that it's a, it's, a, it's a mix of commodity that we are speaking about. Each port handles different commodity. And due to rerouting and rescheduling of vessels, you would find that in one port, you know, has exceeded the budget, the other port has actually not. So, and that's basically due to the uh, issue of logistical disruptions and supply chain issues. Thanks. Thank you for that. So on the converse side, um, would you like to just share what has been the greatest challenge that you have faced as a business or as, uh, within your industry and how have you handled this? So I know we've spoken in general, there's been lots of challenges, but if you almost had to pinpoint a single biggest challenge that could have navigated a different outcome, what would that be and how did you handle it? Tony? Jane, so I think it's it touches on what we're doing here today and it's in the logistics and that's whether it was on the import or the export side. Um, going into a hard lockdown where everything stopped dead that was on land, but everything that was on the water kept moving. Yeah. I think that gave, put us into many of the challenges that we sat within the ports, the congestion, um, while the ports were also dealing with their own issues around high absenteeism, uh, which impacted on productivity, etc. So as an organization, we were faced with 640 foot containers that were being offloaded in Port Elizabeth over the course of three weeks, and we had to find somewhere to put them. Okay, we had also gear up to be able to do that during a hard lockdown where you initially didn't know whether we could move them. Um, I think the knock on effects that, that we had out of that and that still continue today. So, this is not just a South African port issue. If we monitor all of the, the ports that are going from where we load up out of Yokohama in Japan, we move through to Tangent Palapas, then to Colombo, then into Port Louis, Durban, and eventually we end up in Kucha. Every single one of those ports along the way are, have, are facing congestion issues. Shipping lines have taken vessels out of rotation. I think we're all still fighting for even space to get equipment. So 40 foot and 20 foot containers are scarce in the east at the moment. Um, and it's a continual battle and it's not over. It's still going to continue, I would say, for the balance of this year that we're going to be faced with what we will call our logistics challenges to keep the businesses that have started up to keep them going as we work yeah. through the, the, the main stoppages. So, so that for us has been one of the biggest challenges and, and it's going to be in the future to keep things going now that we're back at work. Um, yeah. you know, probably the second one that I'll allude to now was keeping as many of our employees safe through the period we've been, but also into the future. So, you know, we had over 100 positive cases in, in our plant. Unfortunately, we also had one fatality. Uh, but I think in terms of the global statistics and what you look at, that was a very, very small impact. And that's because of the discipline of the people that has continued, whether it's the basics of social distancing, the, the basics of wearing a mask, the basics of sanitization, that's going to be with us for, for a long time to come to keep up the, the, the vigilance and to not let our guards down because this is far from over. Absolutely. Jason? 
Well, just to latch on to Tony, so I agree with that second point, and I think in our case it will be exactly the same. Um, and then secondly, um, we should, must remember that citrus is a perishable good. So for us, planning is very, very important, and that for us was challenging this year. And that's planning from when we need to pick it out of the orchard, when it needs to be packed, how we get it into the cooling facilities, when to get it onto the next vessel, and then when it needs to get into the market. So because it's perishable, you can't just push a lot of citrus into the market and expect that it will be sold at still a good price. So their timing is very important and you've got specific windows for specific markets for specific um, varieties. So that for us was challenging specific with the logistics where they were, we were experiencing um, delays and we were doing risk management and diversifying the risk by not only using the PE port, but diverting to the, to the Durban port, to the um, Cape Town port. Um, but, but, but still we've experienced a lot of delays, um, shipments being two, three weeks delayed, um, missing certain windows, having a big financial impact and also the quality of the fruit arriving. Um, so we had to be very careful of how we manage that. And also we took the um, decision not to wait for a specific ETD, um, which is the week of departure um, with a calculated um, transit time to get to a specific ETA. Once we've got an opportunity to load it onto a vessel, we've loaded it because we knew and we've calculated that there might be a week or two delay in terms of transit. Yeah. Thanks for that. And you know, the interesting thing is, I think it's human nature for us to want to find somebody to blame. And it's easy to peg it on the guy next to us, right? Whoever that guy yeah. is. Um, and I think that there's, for me, there's been a huge les lesson for us as humans here is to really, to, to try and whilst we are suffering within our own businesses, and there's definitely impact, to try and navigate what does the other person's business look like? And understand that they also have a struggle and what is their struggle and and collaborating to find an answer as opposed to blaming and i think that as a country we have quite a strong blame culture and um i think COVID has taught us to be mindful of that um and perhaps that's one of the lessons we need to take forward thank yes, you for that. Thanks for that jason so lauren would you like to just share your biggest challenge yeah, my biggest challenge has actually been getting out of my pajamas every day. Uh, while working <laughs> work. And then the other biggest challenge would be to be in the alcohol ban. That was a huge challenge. <laughs> okay, so seriously. It's, it's, you, you can see it's getting close to five o'clock. <laughs> the, the red wine is calling me. I'm in the Cape, right? I'm in the Cape, so I'm surrounded by all these wine farms. Okay, so transitioning, I think, our sales force has been to, to using the, the online platforms to sell. Because like I said, I hit that crisis mode in, in, initially, you know, um, the first day we, we, we were told we're going to be working from home within three days and said, okay, this, and, and we won't be seeing customers. Uh, so great. Uh, at Expeditors, we have a global sales team, and quite quickly they all got together and um, and rolled out a module sales training. Got the whole sales force globally online to teach the teams how to actually use Zoom, Skype, Teams, and apply the sales process. And this point I'm I'm, I'm making because I think it's relevant to all businesses, right? And exporters that are actually selling a finished product as well um, globally. There, there is no borders anymore where you might have relied on maybe a distributing or marketing agents overseas. Now you have this direct access, right? Where, where you can sell your own product and who can sell it better than you because you're passionate about it, right? So, um, so that's what we saw. That was a challenge initially, but then it became a success story as everyone actually transitioned. We saw customers initially reluctant to put on their video screens. But now it's, a, it's an absolute norm, right? As you were saying earlier, James, just people yeah. are just like, you're not making telephone calls anymore. We, we're connecting via video, right? Yeah. I think the other major challenge that we also experienced though was, um, you know, just with the legislation and what happened in those first 21 days, not getting clear direction from government um, on the do's and the don'ts, uh, you know, the, the the requirements were not properly put through. What we did was we established a crisis management team. We met daily, uh, people with the relevant experience to interpret the d disaster management legislation. 
so we could understand the spirit and the intent of the legislation um, and then share that with, with, with the sales force, with our business as a whole, and with customers. We had lots of webinars going, sharing that the interpretation of those uh, legislative uh, requirements, right? And so there were some things, and I'll just give you just a quick example that, you know, there was um, only essential services to be exported at one time. But for those, ex those companies, they might have been sourcing locally their packaging. But the imports right. of the packaging <laughs> was not considered an essential service. So they were not allowed to bring in. So navigating all these things, you know, was um, it was quite intense and, and definitely contributed to the long, long hours during that first period. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, interesting, because as we were saying earlier, one wonders about the knock-on effect, because you think about it in absolute, but there's always another aspect that needs to come into it. And as you say, like the packaging, who would have thought, right? Yeah. Um, Captain, would you like to share your um, highest challenge, the biggest challenge that you found? Thanks for that question, Jen. So in my view, um, look from the port environment perspective, I would say that the human resources constraints faced by some of the terminal operators um, and also logistics provider, I think was the biggest challenge. Understanding that we have a large number of um, employees or 60 plus and chronics, which were not able to come to work. And that severely impacted on the um, you know supply chain. So for example, yeah. um, you know, the port of PE, exports say about 8 million tons of manganese every year to the port but due to the impact of COVID-19 initially you know um, the some of the operators were not working their full capacity together with the you know the rail uh, that bring lots of manganese volumes to the port so that really impacted us negatively in terms of our revenue and throughput and I think similarly for automotive uh, production as well and the low demand of automotive uh, automotives globally seeing that people taking a lot of vitamin C's and staying indoors, so the supply has gone down or the other demand has gone down, especially in Europe. So, yeah, but I think we, we can see, uh, you know, things getting back to normal. I've seen quite a bit of, um, you know, cargo relating to agro industry, uh, construction material coming to the port, uh, manganese weight getting back to normal. So we getting back to normal slowly, but sure. Thanks. Right. Thank you. Thanks for that. So before we go to Q&A from the, from the um, audience, and we have got some questions that have come through, can you just share with us sort of what have been the two or three key learnings or tips that you would share with, with those watching this, this evening or this afternoon? Um, because I, I often think that hindsight of somebody else is the best foresight for the others. So what is it that you could share that has been a true learning for you that, that maybe we haven't touched on today? that others could learn from from the experience that you've had tony so jane i think we, we, we've touched on it before i think you've always got to try and differentiate from what you can control and what you can't i think we we, we saw a lot of people getting caught up in the emotions of it and trying to find someone to blame there's only so much you can do make sure you've got that that button down um you know you you get into these times one of the biggest impacts are normally financially. So you end up with tying up inventory, working capital, and those become major constraints. So I think as you get into these uh, uh, situations, it's about managing the key aspects of the business, making sure that you can get the financing available that you, that you would need through those periods and, and to make the right decisions. Sometimes you've got to wait and see what happens. You don't know what you don't know. We've learned that through, through this. And, and then you've got to roll with a couple of punches. Yeah. Well, I love that you don't know what you don't know, because I think that before we judge, we need to remember that. Um, we really, there's many of us that don't know what we don't know yet, and each day something else is unfolding. Um, and, you know, the, the whole thing of a plan A and a plan B almost makes us think that if plan A doesn't work, then plan B is our second choice. And one wonders if we shouldn't just even change the the wording around that and say, let's look at different scenarios. If this, then that. Um, mm -hmm. Clemson has been such a great proponent of scenario planning versus plan A, plan B, plan C, because sometimes mm -hmm. plan C, which is maybe the best scenario for us, is almost a failure. So it's perhaps a, a good learning to come from that as well. Mm -hmm. um, Jason, would you like to share your tips? 
Yes, so I, I, would, I would think that risk assessment or risk management should become a vital part of the business processes. I think one easily overlooks that part of your, your evaluation of your business. So that's important to do that as frequent as possible. Um, and then also to, to try and create a culture where one can adapt and be flexible um, to run with these changes and to try and stay at least ahead of the curve. And then lastly, is it's not a bad idea to investigate and to set your business up to be virtual friendly, because I think there are benefits there and one should look into it. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Larry? Yes, so um, mine is very is logistics specific. Um, ocean and air capacity at the moment is very volatile. Um, this will continue into next year um, as shipping lines and airlines uh, try to recover. So I would suggest that you plan for increased rates. Remember, when the when there are capacity constraints, the higher paying freight will move, and the lowest paying freight will get bumped, right? In the general cargo field. Um, so that's that's very important to understand. We also need our airlines and our shipping lines to survive because they have to move the freight, right? So you, I would say that you need to prepare for that. You know, on, 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 your, on the business side, to actually work with your service provider to provide forecasts of shipments, if you can do that, it does empower them to then work with the, the, the airlines and the carriers um, that they have strong relationships with to possibly secure you longer validities and space, right? Forecasts will really help in, 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 the, um, in the future. Lead times are also going to remain unpredictable, so it's important that you're building in sufficient buffering. We, we heard about the, the, the challenges we're having at ports in South Africa, but also overseas. Uh, equipment shortages, um, those types of things are, are also happening. We, we've just gone through significant sh shortages in Asia. Um, and that will cause delays, right? So, so build in that bu buffer time. Um, make sure that your service providers are financially sound. And, and, and I would, again, just reiterate, have effective business continuity plans, also including cybersecurity, right? You know, it's good to talk to your service, service providers about what these cybersecurity protocols, we've seen hacking of major shipping lines, um, even during this period that it have impacted their business. So, um, you know, your, your information is, is, um, is crucial and important. So those protocols will be key. Um, and so, and I think most importantly is, is just remember that we're all in this together. You know, um, I think make sure now more than ever that you you deliberate about taking care of yourself. And the reason I'm saying that is because I didn't actually realize myself that I was sitting for four to five hours on back-to-back -back calls um, yeah. until I started having some lower back issues and I had to change a few things. So uh, we actually have to be deliberate and intentional about standing up, taking breaks, all of these things, right, and really um, eating. <laughs> and we can get so caught up, especially now working from home where people are just going into your calendar and booking you up back to back, right, that you actually take the, the time to look after yourself. And for myself, I, I value human face-to-face -face contact, um, walking up and down stairs more than I ever did before. <laughs> Absolutely. And going to that cupboard that's got all the sweeties and everything in is my downfall because um, I feel like, to your point on self-care, I feel like I'm munching a lot in the moment, but nonetheless. So let's just take a couple of questions from the um, from the floor. Um, Dion, and I think we have we have covered your question regarding the port um, and the constraints. I know that, um, Captain, they are looking for plans. So perhaps in the communication from the port, it would be, be perhaps something that one could do from TMPA to look at um, sharing with your with your guys as to what your plans are to bring up the efficiencies again. Um, Tony, for a question from you: Is Isuzu on a localization drive to play a part in kickstarting the motor industry? So, I think we, there's there's two parts to that. Um, obviously, we're if we look at where we are on our product cycle, we've obviously announced that we've got a, a, the next generation a D Max pickup that will be coming out in early 2022. So there's a lot of work that's going in from the teams now looking towards the future. 
So if you look at what, where we are currently, we're basically getting into the final stages of the life of the current product and our outlook is to the future. Um, there are a number of plans already in place there and a lot of local suppliers have already been appointed. Brilliant. Fantastic. Um, Captain, I'm going to have to bring one one thing up with you. Um, just another question here is, what is the current efficiency of the Kocha port? Now, I know that we made mention earlier that you are port of Port Elizabeth, but let's talk through that, if you can, um, as this is imperative to measure and share with stakeholders. Are you in a position to speak to that? Jane, as I said to you before, I think I work for the port of Port Elizabeth, uh, so I don't think I'll be in a position to comment on Port of Nuha's issues. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a fair representation because it would be the same as somebody speaking on a, on behalf of a branch in the same organization. So are there any other questions? Are those are the questions that have been sent through to me. Um, just from the floor, are there any other questions? Oh, one come through now. Um, with a lot of companies closing down due to lockdown, um, how did it affect Isuzu with their inventory? So, yeah, Jane, if, if we look at that, so we've obviously got imported content as well as, as local content. To date, on our direct supply, we've had no closures of any of our suppliers. Okay, um, There have been some small instances on, let's call them the consumable side of it, but those are more commodities, so we were able to resource where we required, but no significant impact. I just want to say a huge thank you to our panelists. You guys have, have come on to this, knowing that questions might be thrown at you, knowing that somebody on this call is probably unhappy with you in some way, um, whether it's the, a supplier to you or somebody that hasn't, uh, you know, whatever it may be. And you have willingly come on and shared and um, shared the challenges, been vulnerable to exposing a little bit about your business and also sharing the successes. And I think if I had to wrap up just some of the takeaways, um, that came through right from the very beginning. That personal well-being and taking care of staff and yourself has, seems to be a really, really key thread. Um, communication, different ways of communicating, finding new channels and new ways to make sure that the right people hear the right message in the right way at the right time. Collaboration seems to be a key thing, working with your service providers and full value chain, making sure that there is a risk mitigation in that, in that aspect risk mitigation as a strategic intent for your business as well. Um, you know, as, a, as somebody that runs strategy for a lot of companies, they don't have risk assessments. They don't look at how they're going to mitigate risk. Until, and, and often when I bring it up, it's like, no, Jane, you don't understand our industry. We won't have that kind of risk. And yet here we are in every industry being hit by a risk nobody anticipated. So there you have it. Culture and connection of people and navigating a way that is online, being virtual friendly to make sure that people still feel connected to something that is bigger than just a production, a, a, a project plan or a tick box exercise. Um, adapting, you mentioned protecting people and appreciation. We've also spoken about the fact of knowing what you can control versus not control. Um, and yeah, I think the cybersecurity came up as well. I think the, the aspect of fear and keeping people um, keeping people appraised of what is going on because fear has probably been the biggest um, downfall of all of us at this stage. The not knowing what's happening. People, humans like to be in control of, of situations and we have all been out of control in many ways through this, but we have uh, led the way. And leadership showing direction, communication and some form of clarity in how we are moving forward have been the key messages that I have taken from these. So I truly thank you for your time and your insights. Um, there's probably one question I do want to ask just by the way, just because like, let's throw in a curveball here. The United States elections, um, we've got them coming up. And right now, if you go onto CNN, it's Trump, Biden and the, the debates and all the rest of it. How do you feel that countries, particularly the US, have handled COVID um, and what do you think, so it's twofold, how do you think they've handled COVID and what do you think the impact of the United States elections is going to have on our industries moving into a new future? Tony, let me put you on the spot first. Well, since I've been going first the whole day, we might as well continue with that. Exactly. So, so if, if we, 
we, t we, we sit outside and, and we, we look through our optics and we look at the US and how they've dealt with COVID. I think the ostrich analogy with their head in the sand, it didn't work. Okay. Um, I was actually fortunate to have spent some time in, in the US over the, the December holidays that have just gone by. I think from the average people that I spoke to when you were standing in a queue or waiting for something, I think Trump has tremendous support at a ground on the ground, I think he he's telling the average American what they want to hear, and I think as we move through this, he will be re-elected. Uh, what that means for us going forward, I think it's going to mean a little bit more of more uncertainty. Um, I, I think the strategies there are sometimes as loose as a goose, uh, and it's whatever the flavor of the day is. I don't see a clear plan other than the rhetoric that's coming out about getting Americans back to work and making it great. But I think we actually have to start seeing some of that. Yeah. And in terms of anyone else want to share into this? Yeah, just, I just agree with that, guys. I'm really a USA company, so uh, we we see firsthand the, the impact, especially, I mean, there's tax cuts for, for business over there, so there has been some positives that have, has come out of his, um, his, uh, his I was going to say, rain. <laughs> uh, but, um, but I think that, like, also where we've seen some negatives has been the trade war with China, uh, how that's impacted some of the, the businesses, right, in the U.S. as well, where we've seen direct impact on, on their volumes dropping and some companies even closing as a result. So uh, I, I think if he does get re-elected, it's going to be four more years of complete uncertainty, uh, uncertainty uh, for all of us. Yeah. I think more than we realize and between him and, and um, Boris Johnson and a few other uh, top leaders, they, it certainly makes for interesting times in amongst COVID. Um, Jason Faisal, anyone want to add in there? I, I would say that, um, you know, it's all, about, it's all about money, power and lust and hunger for power. That's going to be the new world order anyway. So if, if, if Donald Trump can get that right once again, I think it's going to be a real uh, wrangling of a trade initiative between America and US. I mean, sorry, America and China. And as we all very well know that our economy is very much dependent on Chinese economy. If China coughs, we get the flu. I mean, we know that. So, and the, the recovery of from COVID-19 is going to be very much dependent on the recovery of Chinese economy for that matter. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I was thinking of the, of the correct wording and all that, but Faisal, you hear it um, spot on, so I agree with Faisal. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 all, it's all about power, eh? Um, Trump and well, that politics, know, like, That's politics yes. through and through, isn't it? I mean, um, and I think a lesson for us to learn from that is to stop looking to the politicians for answers to problems that affect business because most of them haven't run businesses or if they have maybe not successful ones either so it's also a good lesson for us not to blame politics but to also look within and say why are we looking to them for our answers um in our own city we should be doing that as well um Dion, to your point uh absolutely hear you on that one and we will look into that with with absolute pleasure so just some notices before i finish off um just some notices to the members who are on board at the moment. Um, if you have any changes to your database, any changes to contacts within your organization, please let Suzanne know because it's important that you get fed the right information to the right people within your organization. So feel free to do that um, and share with Suzanne, please. Our next upcoming online event is Government Assistance Discussion with SASFIN. That's on Wednesday, the 18th of November at 10 o'clock on Teams. Invites will be sent out on Monday, so look in your inbox for that. Our annual sponsor, uh, annual social this year is going to be slightly different because we're not sure whether it's going to be in person, online, etc. But it will be happening much like our banquet did happen, and it was a good one. Um, so save the date for Thursday, the 3rd of December. That is sponsored by S4 Integration. That will be Thursday, 3rd of December at um, half past five or six, and details again will be finalized. Membership invoices, unfortunately, um, we do have to look at invoicing still, even though 
we may not have seen each other, we have still been very buoyant as an organization in keeping the conversation going. So they'll be sent out by the end of October. And um, so just to round off, we used to say that death and taxes were the two, probably the two certainties we had in life. And I'm wondering that for the next foreseeable future, I think COVID will probably be in there as well as a third one, um, because I don't think it's going anywhere very fast. Lockdowns, much like load shedding, is going to become part of life um, as we move through lockdown levels from one, as I say, a client of mine in the Netherlands, suddenly on the highest lockdown level at the moment now again, mm -hmm. and the UK going into that and much of Europe going into that as well. But as we've heard, it's not all doom and gloom. If we take the lessons that we have learned through this and don't long and quickly go back um, to what we had, but actually use the learnings to navigate forward, mm. it, we will be able to react, adapt, work with and uh, synergize to come up with new ways of doing work continuously because this will not be the last pandemic. And um, they've spoken about this pandemic for many years and none of us did anything about it. So let us not be caught in that same position again. So um, just two quotes to end off. Stay committed to your goals, but be flexible in your approach. And the last one that I really love is life is not about waiting for the storm to end, but about learning to dance in the rain. And that's a, that's a huge lesson that we've learned is to, this is our normal. Like it or not, we are in it. There is no waiting for anything. So on that point, thank you again to the entire panelists. Thank you to Oracle Media for hosting us. Thank you to Suzanne and Lude and the team and the committee for putting this together. Thank you always to Quinton, who leads our organization. Um, I'm very proud to be part of Exporters Eastern Cape and have fluid conversations. And 2020, thanks for the lessons, but 2021, please bring some kindness into this. <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy this evening. Stay thank well. You. Thanks, guys. Bye -bye. Thank you.